Uh, guys, I am excited this evening. We have got a fantastic guest here. Um, I'm excited about the fact that uh, that this gentleman has decided or, or has uh, agreed to be on with me this evening. For some obvious reasons, I think it's safe that we um, just go with his name as a uh, as a stage name, present truth, and uh, to give you a little bit of background real quick, and, and he can tell you more himself in a minute. Uh, let me scroll back to something I had on my page here just a second ago. Uh, this gentleman, and he can give us some details here, but he is a clinical and anatomic pathologist that is board certified, um, and I believe also fellowship trained as a surgical in surgical pathology. And so tonight, one of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, is we're going to be talking about why women need sex. And that seems like kind of a crazy topic. It's like, Pete, don't you normally stick with like Torah stuff? Don't you normally <laughs> stick with biblical stuff and like marriage and things like that? Well, this is kind of related. What we're going to find is, as we get deep into this is that the science, the science absolutely, absolutely supports what God teaches in his, uh, in his commandments. And so without, uh, without further ado, I want to introduce and ask, uh, present truth to please introduce himself, give us a little more background, um, and then let's, uh, let's dive into this. I, I'm really, I'm going to be as much ears as probably most of my audience. I'm really looking forward to this, and I'm going to try to keep up with some of the different articles he's going to refer to that I've had opportunity to peruse in advance. So how are you this evening? Uh, doing well, doing well, doing well. Thank you so much for uh, having me on the, uh, on your podcast here. Uh, I think you're you're doing a uh, uh, fantastic work of, you know, bringing Torah to the masses, and um, you know I, I'm really honored to uh, have a chance to uh, to connect with you and to connect with your community as we uh, discuss in detail how science really kind of connects connect with um, uh, the Bible and specifically uh, the law, statutes, and commandments uh, that the Father uh, placed on. Uh, Cole Israel uh, uh, in ancient times. So a little background on me, uh, Brother Pete is, um, you know, I'm originally from the Midwest. And um, in terms of my, my experience and training, uh, my experience religiously, uh, essentially, I was uh, part of a Sabbatarian, uh, very uh, Torah-like uh, uh, family structure, uh, generational family structure uh, for uh, four to five generations back and probably over the last 20 years uh, the father has moved me deeper into uh, Torah uh, and and being able to uh, see how that would apply in modern day and so he's he's blessed me with uh, being able to take uh, the skill sets that you know I've, I've had an opportunity to develop over time and and lend that to the community uh, in a way that will help edify uh, the Kahal help edify the assembly and and help brothers and sisters who who are not necessarily uh, from a messianic or Hebraic uh, perspective uh, uh, be able to tie more into uh, the wisdom uh, that is taught in uh, Torah that that the Father uh, bestowed upon us from Torah. Uh, in terms of my medical background, um, you know, so I went to uh, medical school out in the uh, Midwest, did four years of training. So for those who don't know, uh, after you finish uh, high school. Uh, your four years of high school, secondary school there, then you go on to uh, medical school if you choose to uh, go to the uh, 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 provider route or MD route or uh, classical physician route. And uh, after high school, then there's uh, four years of college. Uh, and then after you finish your four years of college, uh, then you go on to medical school. That's an additional four years uh, of training there. And then uh, in your fourth year of medical school, you decide uh, which area of uh, medicine you want to go into. Uh, so as people know, as, as your uh, audi audience knows, you know, medicine has many different specialties, many different uh, specialties that are broken down into subspecialties, subcategories, and uh, uh, based on your aptitude and based on uh, what you might desire to do uh, as a profession long term. Uh, you can choose to go in uh, to a particular route. Uh, so one of the specialties in medicine uh, is uh, pathology. So uh, pathology is a very old specialty from the 1800s. 
when it was first really created and there was a merger between surgery and pathology. The surgeon used to also do the autopsies uh, in old England and, and, and what have you. And so those, those specialties kind of branched off and one went surgery, the other one went pathology. And so pathology is more of your diagnostic arm uh, that tells you why things happen. So in, in essence, it's the study of disease processes. And mm, so you, okay. you end up learning exactly why diseases happen, the physiology uh, or the processes behind diseases, and uh, the idea is that once you learn how these processes take place in the human body, you can learn how the environment affects that or maybe a, a, a huge causative, uh, play a causative role in that. And so from there, you're able to uh, treat disease from being able to diagnose exactly how the disease started, which in, in ideal, you know, ideally can help uh, your clinicians, your primary care clinicians or your surgeons or your a tertiary more uh, care your secondary physicians be able to find a ways and do treatment uh, to help stop that process in its track. So we're more of a diagnostic arm uh, to medicine. We'll tell you what it is and then your your primary care doc can help treat it and deal with it. So that's basically where we're we're from, so what angle we're from. And so from from that point of medical school, then you choose your specialty. And then there's another three to five years of additional training after medical school uh, that you take to specialize in a particular area. Uh, for pathology, uh, it's currently four years, but at the time I went through, it was five years of training after medical school uh, wow. that, that you had to endure. And then to do a fellowship on top of that, which is an additional one to two years is after you do your, your, your five years of training um, at that point in time. So it was a, uh, quite a long road, and, uh, but it was uh, rewarding in terms of uh, being able to really help uh, open your eyes in terms of how health plays a huge role in, uh, in your spirituality and in your, in your relationship uh, with the Father. Wow, that's, uh, that, that's really interesting. And so your you are wired for and you are um, very intentional, not just in diagnosing, but trying to dig into understanding why. Right. And so that, to, to you know, from the Torah side, my mind is kind of clicking going, well, now I understand how he got here, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's the, it's Start the, digging at church history, you start right. digging into scripture, and you go, wait a minute, that's what they're teaching anyway. Exactly. You, I look at it from a pathologist standpoint to, to see where it all began, right? So, uh, this is where we are, and we shouldn't be here. How did we get here? Let's back the truck up and figure out where, exactly. where it went off the rails. <laughs> exactly. Um, um, Fantastic. Do me a favor. I, I don't know if it's just my system or if uh, if your volume seems awfully low. I don't know if you could sit closer to the mic or what have you. That may help others. I don't know. I'm just you're coming okay. through really, um, really light in my speakers. Okay, and I've see. done settings that I can that I can do. I, uh, although can, can you hear me better now or um, let me see if audio. Let's see here. Uh, mic speaker. Because mm. I have you on headphones now, I can take you off, and I it may be, it let's, may be let, Well, well, let, let's just go ahead and go with that. Now, again, I'm learning this program, and right here it says that it's got automatically adjust mic volume. So maybe that's something that will be done and balanced in uh, post for this particular program. Okay. Uh, so for the for the viewers, for you guys that are my regulars, I'm learning a new program because I'd really like to be able to do some live streaming with some special guests. And we talked about this live stream here. Um, I think what we're doing right now is recording and doing something that I should be able to because I just checked my channel and it's not showing up um, is recording so that I can do some editing because I know that we're going to dip into some topics that we're going to reserve for our Patreon. So if you're not a Patreon, that's something that I would love to have uh, have you consider because we've got some great conversation, good stuff going on in there um, and good opportunity to discuss things that we can't can't necessarily talk about in the same way or same openness, at least out here on YouTube. So, okay. So, um, doctor, you, um, spoke 
we've talked about a couple of things. We actually talked initially about doing a live stream on men's health. And I right. absolutely want to hold you to that at some point sure. in the not too distant future. But in our discussion, one of the things that started coming up was uh, it, an interesting relationship between men and women. And one of the things that that you pointed out to me is that there's a lot of medical research indicating that while a man may not necessarily need a woman for the same reasons that that we're going to talk about tonight, a woman most definitely needs a man in order to be balanced in a lot of different ways and uh, and and circumstances. So I don't know how you want to jump into all sure. of this. I've got a bunch of articles on Q and all of these links I will put in the show notes when uh, when this all comes together, hopefully to be released in a couple of days. But you tell me, and I'll sure, try to sure, articles absolutely. as you go, and you take us on a journey. Well, I, I tell you, the first time I, um, I would say maybe about uh, six, seven years back, um, I started doing a, uh, a lot of research on uh, fruit flies and the roles, you know, in terms of, fruit, you know, when you go into medical science and health, uh, fruit flies are like one of the number one uh, testing uh, subjects for uh, medications, for just experiments in general in terms of uh, trying to understand physiology and uh, uh, chemicals in general. And I came across the very first time I, I, I came across a subject matter that, that dealt with um, human se well, sexuality in general and the importance that the male plays in terms of, uh, uh, of interacting with the female genome in any species. Uh, were uh, really with uh, fruit flies and um, understanding exactly how that work actually bled into uh, higher mammals, uh, into other species. And then as the material developed, uh, there was a lot of research there between, uh, you know, the gene exchange between uh, male and female and the role that the man plays uh, in the home, in the family, uh, in the very uh, peace of mind uh, of women. And so that was um, mind boggling simply because, you know, from a man's standpoint, uh, you know, society has taught us for many years that we're more of, uh, uh, of a utility, uh, you know, in the culture, you know, if, we, if we're not able to do a physical task or physical labor or produce some kind of uh, financial benefit, then our role, we are, we are, uh, we don't have any value, right? And so, science would tell you something totally different um, to that. And so, it's a, you have to dig a little bit deeper, but it's hidden in terms of the the importance that the man plays to the uh, to the basic physiology uh, of the human species. So, I just want to take it with where I started. Um, you know, one of the articles that you have queued up here. Uh, and, 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 you know, remember for the audience, we're, we're talking about the role that the man plays or the responsibility that the man has in terms of uh, helping to support and manage his household and to provide for his household, not just from a material uh, standpoint or from a, a modern day uh, money standpoint, but from a biological standpoint. And I, I think that's uh, where we'll probably kick that off. Uh, in dealing with the birds and the bees. So one of the first articles you have up uh, there that you'll be able to pull up is the Royal Society, uh, which is a journal uh, that really pulls out various research studies uh, that deal with biology. And uh, there was a great article here that one of the first articles that I uh, had in my, uh, that I became aware of um, was this one, and we'll just jump right into it. And it's uh, dealing with sexuality in general. And um, the uh, title of it is uh, semen, semen, male semen in general, takes control of female genes. Fascinating title. And uh, the title in general will just, uh, you know, raise many eyebrows, but it was an interesting study. Now this was done back in 2012 and uh, there are a couple surprises here, and I'll just kind of uh, go down, and we'll we'll I'll kind of pull out various parts to this um, uh, article, and then we can kind of discuss it from, you know, what is that saying to us now, and 
do we have anything in uh, the ancient writings in, in the Torah that mm. supports this? And, uh, you know, what, how does that play a role in our everyday life in terms of how we uh, build a community from a Messianic Hebraic perspective? Mm. And um, just starting off with this, so uh, the title of this article is A Semen Takes Control of a Female's Genes. And in uh, and, and looking at the article, 2012 Royal uh, Society here, and it starts off with a real big bang here. And it says, uh, sex can trigger re uh, remarkable female responses, including altered fertility, immunity, uh, libido, eating, and sleeping patterns. Okay, so right there, it tells you up front that uh, sex or, or what we uh, mating um, triggers right into those uh, responses up front. So these are key things to life, fertility, immunity, libido, eating and sleeping patterns. Uh, by activation of diverse uh, set of genes, according to research published, right? So this is proceedings they had at one of their meetings and uh, they're gonna discuss these findings here. So uh, Drosophilus, which is uh, the fruit fly, as we stated before, was the uh, uh, mode that they were testing, right? So they had these fruit flies and they were doing experiments to try and uh, uh, develop information and they came across a couple of disco discoveries here. So the first uh, point they brought out was that um, they discovered that a single protein found in the semen of these flies, right, of the male species here, of the, of the male arm of the species, generated a wide uh, range of responses in many genes uh, in the female which became apparent at different times and at different parts of the female's body during mating. Uh, the findings could in principle be akin to responses in many animals, including humans. So right off the bat, they found out that there's, there's proteins, not just spermatozoa. When we think of the, bird of the birds and the bees, uh, we know that men produce sperm, right? And, and mm -hmm. sperm connects with the egg. And uh, then that's how you develop an embryo. But here you have the surrounding fluid uh, that the sperm travels in, it has different properties as well too. Proteins that are associated with associated with it. Yeah, and I, I know you know we we hear about pheromones and stuff like that, and I've always thought, well, that's kind of interesting. What what kind of does that? But this is going way beyond that. Yeah, yeah. This this is this was surprising to them. So um, this tells you that the very essence of. Uh, uh, the male species itself carries something that that has a, a direct effect on uh, of being of the female of the species. So it's 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 getting ready to jump in the deep end here. All right. And cool. um, just kind of con uh, continuing on. Uh, so the lead researcher here, uh, Dr. Chapman, um, at the Biological Science School here, said it's already known uh, that seminal fluid proteins transfer transferred from males during mating cause uh, remarkable effects in females, okay? Including uh, altered uh, egg laying, feeding, immunity, sleep patterns, water balance, sexual receptivity, okay? And they go, she goes a little bit deeper into this and says, hey, uh, you know, we tested here the effects of one uh, particular protein, the uh, uh, seminal protein known as sex peptide, okay? And it was found uh, to change the expression of a remarkable array of many genes in the female, both across time and at different parts of the body. So what makes that surprising that, that this is a peptide or a protein? This now, generally speaking, you know, in science, we always say, oh, you know what, if you, you know, DNA will cause changes into, you know, one's proteins. But here, what was really interesting here is that you have certain peptides that are causing these changes um, that, may not necessarily even be at the DNA level. You just, the protein expression itself generates a reaction in the female. So there are certain proteins carried in the seminal fluid that can cause changes in the female's DNA. In other words, it'll cut things on or cut things off and, and change, the, change uh, processes in the female. So that was mind blowing, right? So this is 2012, they're coming across this information and they're like, Wow, we, they didn't know it before. And just kind of continuing here, it says, um, there were significant alterations to genes linked to egg development, early uh, embryogenesis, which is in the embryos and when it's first starting out, 
uh, you have these proteins that are coming from the, ma uh, the male in the species. These are the proteins that are in the seminal fluid and they are, are affecting the development of the egg even at the embryo le uh, level, at the conception level. Okay, so that's really what that's saying. It's changing the immunity, uh, the nutrients, uh, the behavior unexpectedly, okay, and uh, uh, phototransduction. So different aspects of uh, the very conception itself, it's changing, okay? And uh, the highlighted part they have here is, is this next paragraph, and it says, it showed that the semen protein is a master regulator, which ultimately means that males effectively have a direct, not indirect, a direct and global influence on the behavior and reproductive system of the female. Boom. Wowzers. Uh, um, and that's at the, at the level of a fly, of a fruit fly. Now this is, the, you know, when you're, you're talking about biological systems and you're, you're, you're speaking of the level of a fruit fly, now can you imagine as you start to grow in size in terms of mammals of different sizes up to uh, the fullness of humanity? Just okay, the, so the the uh, the um, the complexity of it increases exponentially, <laughs> exponentially, and, and thereby the things that it can do, uh, almost like uh, you know a created uh, a, a, a designer creator sort of knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it really it really is an intelligent it's almost like a yeah. smart uh it's almost like a nanotechnology right you think right, of nanotechnology right, right. and you think of something that it's like a a basic building block but it has the ability to cut things on cut things off and then to amass and change uh for but but not without purpose <laughs> for right. a particular purpose um and so this is really fascinating to them because now, you know, their next statement at the end of this was that, hey, um, you know, it's a master regulator. Uh, it has direct and global influence on the behavior and reproductive systems of females. Such effects may well occur across species. That's wow. the key. That's, that's the key that unlocks the door. Mm -hmm. They realize now that the role of the man is much more than just a warm body Ooh, much wow. the male of the species much more than just a warm body much more than just a a a, a basic utility that you can uh exchange and uh, you know interchange with you know here and there no no it's it's a very specific master or type of headship uh, ideology built into the biology Okay, it's something built into the biology that they haven't known. Okay, and uh, the last couple statements are, are telling. It says, an additional and intriguing twist is that the effects of semen proteins can favor the interest of males whilst generating costs in the female, resulting in sexual conflict. So this is something that they put out here. They said, hey, listen, when a man mates, or not a man, but when a male of a species mates, the very protein that he gives her uh, will cause her to respond specifically to that male. Wow. Not to other males or anything else. And as we get into some of the other research papers, uh, you know, we'll also see that uh, it, it actually uh, affects the immunity in such a way to where uh, the immunity starts to seek and want to destroy other uh, uh, semen from other males that may have uh, been some type of uh, uh, had some kind of indirect or direct interaction that there, there will be a re almost like an immune reaction Very because she's already been exposed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I know where we're going with a number of these different things. And of course, you're, you know, the lights are going to come on more quickly for me than some of the audience. But um this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating, particularly uh, in confirming, I think, part of the purpose for the title here, you know, not just that, mm -hmm. that women need sex, but um, men need to make sure that they are meeting their woman's conjugal needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Often. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, 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 and as we talk about uh, different required, a minimum requirement, right? You know, right. You think of Exodus 2110 and, and you think and, of and, that. And, and I'm thinking in terms of that last statement or the next to the last statement you made, wherein um, she she will respond to the man that has been planting seed. She tends to respond yes. more directly to that. And so it's incumbent upon him to be doing what it, you know, part well, of his supposed, duty causes her to continue to be connected or more strongly connected to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So, so we're seeing some links, you know, for those who are, uh, who, who uh, study Torah, those who are, uh, Torah observant, you will start to, things will start to kind of make sense, not just from a scriptural, spiritual standpoint, but you can see that that almost, it's almost symbolic as if the Torah is written into the DNA. Okay, mm. So that's something that, that may click a light on for some folks. Um, if we uh, continue on here and, and we'll see like one of the uh, last sentence sentences here, uh, the last sentence here says, for example, there can be a tug of war where males employ semen proteins to ensure that females make a large investment in the current brood, hmm. even if that doesn't suit the long-term interests of the female. So that's pretty heavy. That's a heavy statement. So when you enjoy, you know, if you think of it from a biological with lower mammals, uh, you know, they will copulate, they will, um, you know, have sexual intercourse quite a bit. And the role of sexual intercourse is not just what we've been told in literature, right? Oh, romanticism. Uh, oh, you know what? Uh, love stories, love songs, mm. R&B. No, it's a maintenance uh, type of uh, uh, duty, a responsibility. And it is a br- it's a huge slab of the foundation in terms of building households. Wow. Yes. Right. And yeah. uh, it, it's it, it, it is indispensable. You know, the idea of a sexless marriage. And and we um, we easily think about this in terms of a lion and his pride. Right. Or we think about this in terms, you know, it you know, it's easy to look into nature and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a uh, a particular species or whatever, the male is going to be intentional in marking his territory mm-hmm. and making mm-hmm. sure that uh, I guess we had goats here. And so the buck was mm-hmm. always very intentional, not just in um, marking his territory, but essentially marking the females. They were his. He's mm-hmm. he's doing what it takes in order to demonstrate that they belong to him. And then, you know, obviously, I guess the deeper part of the article here is that then they have a they have a responsibility even to the point of uh, of selflessness yes. to ensure the the progeny of that male. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's part of the role of being a helpmeet. That's part mm-hmm. of a role of helping him build his house in terms mm-hmm. of the way scripture is written with regards to the male. Yeah. And even from a scientific standpoint, they say that the employment of the proteins themselves ensure not not they didn't use wording like help or yeah, I'll, I, I'll maybe put that back up you know but it ensures in other words it's a it's a type of like they said earlier in the article a master regulator a controlling regulator so the type of uh, wording they use here is that the proteins themselves ensure causes it's the cause right uh, it causes, it controls, it turns on, it regulates the point so that the female has a large investment in the current brood of that male. So it's something that has to be performed, has to be maintained hmm. so that that connection stays there, even from a level of a lower uh, entity or creature, a smaller entity like a fly, a fruit fly, which is... The smallest so, of the fries. fries. If we think about that, for example, you know, we've we've got a a nest of barn swallows in the um, barn in in our garage right here, and the four young hatched. Maybe this morning was when we when we first saw four little heads peeping up over the top of the uh, over the top of the nest. 
but that mom has been sitting on that uh, those those uh, eggs for 30 days. She runs out and gets something to eat, comes running back and, and sits there. Um, interestingly, I didn't realize that, that the pair, the male stays with her. He's always somewhere close. He's keeping an eye on what have you. And he may help feed, but she's got a continued obligation to those little ones that goes forward for at least another two or three mm -hmm. weeks before she can mm -hmm. be off doing her thing and they're out of the nest. Um, same thing, I guess it's talking about here, ensuring that the female makes a large investment. Mm -hmm. We talk, we, we, I, I guess, cognitively think about a woman that is dedicated to taking care of that baby. You know, it's mm -hmm. going to be hard work and it's going to be a lot of nights that you're up all night or you're going to get up 14 times a night or, you know, whatever the, whatever mm -hmm. this constant thing is where she's going to be short on sleep and she's ultra busy and everything else. And we think, oh, that's just mom being mom, but mm -hmm. it's not. It's because the man has planted that in her to make an investment in his young. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. And, and so that's wow. uh, it's 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 really powerful. And 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 I will tell you, you know, even up at the uh, the top part of the article, uh, you know, the things that it controlled, right? The things that that master protein controlled were essential things that deal with uh, how a person. Uh, response to stress, right? Uh, so there, there are a couple of things. It, it was the responses that that protein affected was uh, fertility. That was one immunity, right? We know in the science beta, now yeah. that that your immune system plays a role even in depression, uh, anxiety. Uh, in addition to that, uh, eating and sleeping. We know that one of the big issues with depression, uh, specifically our alterations in eating pattern and sleeping and weight gain and what have you. So, hmm. uh, so when you look at what that sex protein does, it's things that directly affect one's perception of happiness, right? Hmm. Of, 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 uh, uh feeling, um, uh, satiated with life. Right. So, so these are some really key things that they're bringing out in just this, uh, starter article here. Right. And it's not just satiated in the moment. It's satiated with life. And that's with an life. important, a, important uh, um, point that you make there. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, so um, so we, we can see here that uh, the command the father had uh, in the scriptures, right? When, you, when we look at some of the responsibilities of the man to make sure to give conjugal rights to his women, to his Isha, uh, is very important, not just because it's is something said, but the father has a whole plan behind it when he's telling you, hey, you need to make sure to take care of this business as uh, the covering for uh, uh, a woman. Uh, and now we're seeing the science behind it, the reasons why. Wow, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, any other thoughts with that before we jump to the next article? Oh no! I'd say yeah. This is this is just going to build because I already see connections to the next several articles. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'll tell you the next article I kind of want to uh, uh, touch on is we're we're dealing with this uh, regulatory protein. I wanted to go to uh, the one we had on our list for uh, semen is good for women's health and fights depression. So I wanted to kind of link that. That first article we looked at there uh, gives us the background on the regulatory protein itself. And now I wanted to kind of look at how it fights, um, how it fights depression in women. Uh, yeah, I was never taught that in grade school. Okay, so. <laughs> cool, yes. Let's see here. So we pulled this article, okay, excellent. So this article was really, really interesting. Now this was in the Daily Mail, um, but it's uh, referencing, uh, some studies and, and some uh, things that were brought out from the State University of New York. Uh, so it was a study that was carried out there that uh, talked about sex, specifically it was dealing with uh, oral sex, but then as it got down deeper, they started to deal with uh, just sex in general and the chemicals that are exchanged uh, from a male to female perspective and how that uh, actually fights depression, right? So when we look at some st uh, studies of, of depression, it's so high in the West uh, that it's mind boggling. And, you know, we just came from 2020, uh, 2021, you know, we just got done dealing with the uh, 
COVID, COVID um, uh, epidemic and depression was through the roof. Suicides went up, depression went up, uh, treatment for depression went up, skyrocketed during that time period uh, because our social interaction changed drastically from what uh, we have you know, always known. And so this, this article kind of dovetails off into uh, that from a woman's perspective, from a male to female perspective and some important things about biology here. So let's take a look at this. Um, so starting at the beginning here, it says, hey, oral sex is good for women's health and makes you feel happier. According to the study, uh, uh, according to a study which studied the effects of semen's mood altering chemicals. Wow. Okay. So mm. from the from the fruit flies, we we found out that master proteins can certainly regulate things like eating and sleeping. But now we're getting ready to go into a deeper perspective, and we're dealing with humans now. Uh, so we'll start here. It says the State University of New York study, which uh, scientists uh, carried out uh, via survey uh, rather than uh, through practical experiments, uh, compared compared the sex lives of 293 females uh, to their mental health, okay? So this is what we're dealing with now. So we know that um, women are really affected uh, with depression, male and female are, but women specifically are to very high levels in, uh, in the Western uh, countries. And so it says it, it follows uh, research, right? Which showed that seminal fluid contains chemicals that elevate mood, number one, increase affection, oh, number two, induced sleep, and also contained at least three antidepressants. Get out of here. Wowzers. Get out of here. So, so what we're seeing now is that normal, your normal uh, biologic fluids there of the man, right? Uh, if he uh, is given that in a, in a normal, healthy relationship to uh, his woman, he has three built-in antidepressants and other chemicals that affect mood, affection and give you mm. good sleep. Amazing, all right? right. Uh, these researchers also claim that women who have had regular unprotected sex are less depressed and perform better on cognitive tests, okay? All right, so that, so it affects intellect as well. Okay? They're smarter. Yeah, they're smarter. It's a, <laughs> it, so, so when you I'm, say- I, I am really, I, I have to tell you, I'm desperately trying not to make a whole lot of jokes <laughs> as we go through. <laughs> right. This is great stuff, but at the same time, it's, you know. It's, 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 it's you know, it's stuff that intuitively, um, you know, maybe the, the, the uh, older generations have known, but you didn't have the science behind it. But it's almost comical because mm -hmm. it's always been there. Right. But right, right. modern science is just now, uh, uncovering uh, things. And it says here that semen contains other chemicals along with spermatozoa, right? Those are the reproductive uh, cells of a man, uh, including cortisol, which is known uh, to increase in affection. Uh, estrone, which is a type of estrogen, which elevates mood, oxytocin, oxytocin uh, which also elevates mood, and oxytocin is known as the bonding chemical, right? Whenever you uh, hmm. kiss or, uh, or, or touch, it's, oxytocin is usually released. And it's a type of, it's known in the literature as being more of the bonding chemical. Um, it also contains uh, thyroid, thyroid tropin releasing hormone, uh, which is another antidepressant. It deals with the thyroid there um, and making sure that you have plenty of thyroid hormone out in your bloodstream, okay? Uh, melatonin, that's a sleep agent, we know that and even serotonin, which is the number one, the best known antidepressant neurotransmitter, okay? Wow. So all these things are now marketed and you can buy and sell these uh, uh, synthetic forms of these medications, but these are, were already built in the human system. And uh, the father already implanted us with the ability to make these chemicals. Okay, so that's very interesting. Okay, so all these things are affected just in uh, seminal fluid. Given these ingredient, ingredients, uh, and this is just a small sample of the mind altering drugs found in human semen. So they're not even going all the way deep into every single drug. So there's other 
uh, wow. uh, yeah. chemicals in there. But um, these are the main key things. Um, the researcher, uh, researcher Gap uh, Baruch and Brooke, uh, along with uh, uh, the psychologist Stephen uh, Paytech, uh, hypothesized that women having unprotected sex uh, should be less depressed uh, than uh, suitable control uh, participants. So, you know, their whole philosophy was, their whole idea was when they came to this, the conclusion was, hey, technically, if you have women in these normal uh, long-term relationships, uh, when you look at all the numbers, when you look at everything drawn out, they should in fact be less depressed and have a better quality of life. When you read between the lines, this is exactly what this, this is what they are hypothesizing, uh, citing here. And um, so if we look here, we'll go deeper into the study. It says, uh, to investigate whether semen has antidepressant effects, the author has rounded up uh, 293 college females uh, from the uh, University of Albany campus uh, who agreed to fill out anonymous questionnaires uh, about their sex life, basically. Uh, recent sexual activity without condoms uh, was used as an indirect measure of seminal uh, plasma circulating in the woman's body. So basically, this is saying, hey, listen, you know what? You just tell us you, uh, you're in, if you agree to uh, look at this questionnaire, you tell us your sex habits, how often you're having sex, your partner. Um, and, and so we're going to use this as an indirect measure of how much exposure you have to uh, seminal fluid. So that's ba it's a very basic uh, uh, research study that they're using here. Uh, each participant also uh, completed the Beck Depression Inventory, a commonly used uh, uh, clinical measure of depressive uh, symptoms. Okay, so they used a they and they just basically said, "Hey, how do you feel?" Just write down. The most significant finding from this study, uh, published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior, were that even after adjusting for frequency of sexual intercourse, women who engaged in sex and never used condoms showed significantly different uh, depressive symptoms than those- Significantly fewer, yeah. Uh, fewer uh, depressive sy symptoms uh, yeah. than did those who usually or always use condoms. Significantly fewer. Okay, so there's a bit, that's, a, that's saying a lot there. Importantly, yeah. the, yeah, go ahead. Let me let, let me make a quick point here. I think one of the things that that I have been teaching among men that I work with is that uh, you know one of the commands that we have is to be fruitful and multiply, um, and so something that a man should not ever do is get a vasectomy. And I'm assuming you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that because of, you know, having a vasectomy is going to significantly reduce all of these benefits to a woman, even if she's your wife and you're mm -hmm. having regular contact with her. Um, you've got to find some other way to, you know, if, if you're going to regulate. Now, I'm not I'm not a fan of regulating how many children you have um, to full disclosure. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, 56 years old. We have four boys. I got a vasectomy when I was, you know, long before Torah, before I understood that commandment. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things I look back now and I regret. And of right. course, this study right here further drives that point home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that um, controlling that or cutting off the cut, cutting off the supply or, mm -hmm. or taking out of the most high's hands, the ability to give or not give children. And of course this takes us down a different rabbit trail mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is not something that, that I ever recommend now, but obviously there are other reasons not mm -hmm. to, as I look at this article. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you for vasectomies from the research, from the latest research out with vasectomies, the tubes that bring uh, spermatozoa up, uh, in, in into uh, ejaculate fluid um, are actually different to tubes that actually put the seminal fluid uh, into the ejaculate. So okay. basically your seminal fluid is coming from your prostate. And gotcha. then um, from your testes, uh, you have other tubes that are coming up to actually merge with the seminal fluid okay. and so that you have the combination of both. So what- Well, cool, yeah, thanks. Yeah, and scientifically what they, do is that they just cut the tubes uh, to the actual um, uh, to the actual uh, testes without uh, messing with anything for the prostate. So you can still get 
the seminal fluid out, which has all these benefits. Which is, okay. Uh, absolutely. Now, of Very course, nice. you don't have the exchange of genes that would happen with spermatozoa because spermatozoa themselves, even if you don't uh, get a wife, uh, you know, pregnant, even if you don't get a woman pregnant, that the spermatozoa still lodge themselves into the woman for eternity. Right. So we'll see later on that yeah, they still lock that. right in there for eternity and give added benefit as well, too. But that bulk benefit you get from the seminal fluid is not cut off with vasectomy. Mm. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, and just kind of going down here. So uh, with that, so significantly fewer depressive symptoms than those who usually are always use condoms. Importantly, these uh, chronic, uh, chronically condomless uh, sexual active women also evidence fewer uh, depressed, depressive symptoms than those who abstain from sex altogether, right? Wow. Uh, so this is kind of like those who decide to be um, completely abstinent. Uh, you know, it makes me think of, you know, different uh, religious orders and what have you. Um, you know, they have more challenges than women who are uh, functioning in a uh, more traditional uh, stance there. Um, and lastly, yeah. it says, yeah, go ahead. It if I may take a second and point something out, now we can cover this in more detail later maybe, but in God's economy, according to the way male and female are supposed to function, um, I don't see a whole lot of room in what's written in the Torah for women to be in in a celibate or uh, long-term abstaining state. I see Absolutely. where men can be single, but women are always to be covered. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we can talk about that in more detail, but Men don't receive from women, and maybe you can correct me as we go, but they don't receive from women quite the same benefit in, that's reciprocal. This is everything. It's a one-way relationship from mm -hmm. the man to the woman that belongs to him, and it's something that she literally needs. That It's a need. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a biological need. Which, which it helps explain why, you know— um, Scripture says maybe abstain for a time by uh, by agreement. I think First Corinthians chapter seven. But the Absolutely. bottom line is 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 women should never be in a place of long term extended abstinence because it's detrimental to their health 100%. and their mental stability, their well being, the whole nine yards. Yeah, one hundred percent. I would agree with that one hundred percent, and uh, and and that is exactly how the scripture uh, presents it. Wow. And uh, and so what we're seeing here is that science is really just uh, 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 walking parallel with what uh, is already written. So I think that's uh, yeah, that's fascinating. That's really I fascinating. would say it's confirming what's already. <laughs> yeah, it's written. confirming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and it and and it says here just to kind of uh, uh, finish on here. Uh, it says uh, the research suggests. It is not just the women who are having uh, sex are simply happier. It's not just that they're happier, uh, but that the happiness levels might be related to the quantity. And this is just what you're saying to the quantity of semen within the body, right? So it's a normal, regular uh, a maintenance that uh, or due diligence that the man uh, performs to his woman that helps to keep her chemicals thus her uh, uh, perception, thus her very uh, body healthy. And so she's not experiencing uh, depression and, and things like that to the extent uh, that those who are not receiving um, covering. Okay, so it's, it's just, it's, it's really fascinating. That says quite a bit um, uh, just in general. And, that, and that's just a basic study. They're, they're, not doing any, they're not doing any lab work here. They are simply taking surveys and from the surveys, drawing these conclusions uh, basically in real time. So that's, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Wow. And uh, yeah. Any, any other thoughts with that? That was, that was pretty power packed there. No. Yeah. This is, it, it's continuing to build. I know, you know, I know where, where we're going and continuing to go. So yeah, let's keep going. This is all good. right. All right. Um, so, so we had talked a little bit, uh, before I, I wanted to pull up the article, uh, from science news, uh, and it's kind of a summary of some of the other articles that we have. And this one is semen secrets, uh, how a, uh, previously 
a previous sexual partner can influence uh, another man's offspring. So we're going to kind of dive into uh, some of the chastity laws uh, that are, uh, are written in the Torah and and why uh, the ancient culture, the ancient Hebraic culture thought this was so important. Um, and is there really an effect? You know, in the West, we're taught in general that, hey, you know what? The, you, you, you know what? You hear the guys talk about it now. Body count doesn't matter. OK, uh, you know, but it may matter more than you think. It's not mm. as it may matter more than you think. And um, it may matter quite a bit in terms of your happiness and in terms of even your next generation. Right. So um, it, it kind of makes me think after we get done with, with this uh, article, but you'll you'll kind of see that, you know, there were certain laws in Torah where say, you know, people who came from these very strict uh, pagan cultures that had very abominable practices uh, for uh, people who wanted to come into more of a Hebraic lifestyle, Hebraic culture into Kol Israel. Uh, oftentimes in the Torah, they, you know, had to wait, you know, three generations. And in some cases, there were some that were like 10 generations. And I always wondered, you know, when I first came to Torah, I always wondered, well, why would the father do that? Uh, was it just simply uh, for them to just learn the culture. Hey, it'll take you three generations for culture. Or was he doing a type of uh, cleanup protocol back uh, before? Uh, cleansing. Yeah, cleansing type of protocol back before uh, the death of uh, Yahusha. Uh, was there was there something else going on that he was purging uh, there? So it's, it's something to kind of think about, right? That's a question that I always had there. And, and so science kind of tells us a few things here that uh, are, are quite uh, interesting. So this next article here, we'll kind of go through it, but we'll, we'll read the summary here. And the summary will tell us a little bit, and so we'll go from there. Uh, scientists have discovered, so the name of this article is, uh, as I stated before, was uh, Semen Secrets, how a previous sexual partner can influence another male's offspring. Mind-blowing, right? We're not taught that in school. It's a totally different concept than uh, what we have learned. So in 2014, right? So this is October 2014, a little while ago, um, but you don't hear about it on mainstream news. So uh, scientists have discovered a new form of non-genetic inheritance uh, showing for the first time, right? This is new stuff. For the first time, that offspring can resemble a mother's previous sexual partner in flies at least. And they leave it there. Researchers manipulated the size of male flies and studied their offspring. They found that the size of the young was determined by the size of the first male that had made it with their mother when she was a virgin. Basically, that's what happened with the experiment. Rather than the second male that sired the offspring. Okay, so that's a power pack statement uh, that they're dealing with right now. So we'll take a look at this article and we'll just kind of go down and read real quick. Uh, scientists have to discover, discovered a new form of non-genetic inheritance showing for the first time the offspring can resemble a mother's previous sexual partner and at least flies, uh, the confronting idea, this confronting idea known as uh, telegony. Okay, so that was telegony, just to give you some background on telegony, uh, it was a term um, that really uh, started to be used uh, in a modern sense uh, in uh, the 1830s. Before that, though, Aristotle had really uh, coined the, the idea that um, a, a, a woman, a virgin woman, if uh, she lay with a man and she did not marry that man, uh, somehow there was some communication of DNA or uh, uh, of, of, of chemicals that would affect the following progeny. So Aristotle really uh, hypothesized this idea in, uh, in the modern sense, and, you know, during the time period uh, of the Renaissance type of uh, uh, time frame there. But before that, when you look at Torah, uh, you have some idea that this kind of principle could even exist in the law of the Leverite, right? Uh, if we go back to like Genesis, uh, I, I think it's 39 or 38, where Onan uh, was told to, uh, by Judah, uh, to yeah, 38. Uh, give, yeah, to 38, to told by Judah to, you know, could, you know, marry your, uh, your dead uh, brother's uh, wife, and give the first son, give her a offspring, and that offspring will be in the name of your deceased brother. 
And Owen didn't do it. And uh, uh, he purposefully didn't do it. And the Lord put him to death because of it. And in the text, in some uh, versions of the text, it says that he didn't want to do it because he knew that that first child would not be his. So when I looked at that from a surface le level years ago, I was like, oh, okay. So he just didn't want to do it because he knew that child was going to get some other rights and uh, other land and, 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 and not be considered his. But it could be even on a deeper level when we look at the biology. Okay, so um, kind of moving on with this idea uh, to ligony. Uh, dates back to ancient Greeks. Um, but the claim was that it was discredited in the 20th century with the advent of genetics, right? So that was the claim. Uh, to test it out, um, Australian uh, scientist, Dr. Uh, Angela uh, Crean, professor, right? At, um, uh, and an another professor, uh, Russell, I think is uh, uh, Berensky and Dr. Copps manipulated the size of male flies and studied their offspring. They found that the size of the young uh, was determined by the size of the first male uh, the mother mated with rather than the second male that actually sired the offspring. Our discovery, and this is their own quote, our discovery complicates our entire view of how variation is transmitted across generations, but also opens up a new, uh, opens up exciting new possibilities and avenues of research. Uh, just as we think uh, we have figured out things, basically, uh, nature throws us a curveball and shows us that we still have much to learn. The researchers propose uh, that the effect is due to the molecules in the seminal fluid of the first mate being absorbed in the female's immature eggs and then influencing the actual growth of the offspring and subsequent male, uh, males. That's, that's pretty heavy. Uh, what, what they're basically saying is that the actual Similar, they're not even talking about DNA per se, the spermatozoa, because there was no mating that existed that took place. There was no siring of any progeny that took place with the first mate. Just the act of copulation without siring caused a biological change and in information passed from the first male that got displayed when the second male came to sire progeny. Unbelievable state. Really heavy. So, uh, so do we think that maybe that is why Yahuwah says that uh, that a woman should remain a virgin until she's married and that she shouldn't be bouncing around with other men? Absolutely. I think that has all to do with it. Absolutely. Because there's information that is given by each man that uh, lay, lies with the woman. Okay. Information right. now, is we're, distributed. We're going to see some more stuff that indicates that that, that, that that information coming from each man that she lay with stays within her and affects the future. <laughs> In a major way. In wow. a major way. Yeah. Wow, wow, In a major wow. way. Absolutely. And um, and I'll, I'll point something else out as we go further. We'll have some other articles here. I, I think when we look at the way the effects were uh, and played out, that's why it's so important. Uh, to receive uh, Yahusha, uh, not only for forgiveness of sin, but also for healing, right? There's a lot of healing that has to play, take place, not just spiritual healing, but physical healing, which is one of the missions he had when he was here. You know, wow. every time sin was forgiven, he also healed. So you can't break the two up and say healing is separate from, you know, spiritual healing is separate right. from Physical, no, no, they, they, he did them together. Right, you know? absolutely. Yeah, and so I think that's going to play a big role with people who have not known Torah, lived a particular lifestyle, and then come out. Mm. So there's a spiritual and physical healing that takes place by the power of the Ruach. Amen. Yeah, so, uh, so just kind of continuing on with this, it says here that... Um, where we left off at, I want to make sure I got my uh, spot here. Okay. And uh, uh, here we go. Subsequent males. Okay, mates. Uh, the study is published in the Ecology Letters. Uh, the team produced large and small fl uh, flies by feeding them um, diets as larvae, right? So when they were maggots, they uh, received high nutrient diets, low nutrient diets. Uh, then they made it uh, the immature females with either, with either the large or small males. Uh, once the females had matured, 
they were mated again with either smaller, uh, the small or large uh, ma males, and, and then the offspring were studied. Uh, we found that even the, uh, though the second male sired the offspring, even though they sired the offspring, offspring size was determined by what the mother's previous mating par uh, partner ate wow. uh, as a maggot. Wow, as a wow, maggot. Wow. So what does that tell you about clean, uh, about kosher diets or, or, or biblically clean foods? And it, it, it's fascinating that it's not just, you know, affected by the previous mating partner's DNA or genetics mm -hmm. or whatever, but actually going so far as to what that male ate. Again, exactly. so important in, you know, in who, you know, selectivity in who yes. they choose and what their background is. And this goes back to Cole Israel. Why do you marry within the tribe or why do you marry within the, the larger family, the people, opposed to going out and marrying from the nations? Absolutely. Even down to the diet of potential mates. Now, an, an interesting point, I guess something to stop and consider here, too, though, with the eating or, or with, the, with the marrying in the nations, it would be the males taking females. So the yes. Israelite male could affect, for example, if you had a war bride or something of that sort, he, he could, could affect her positively, affect her, but not in reverse. Yes. Yes. That's what this is. No it's examples in scripture showing. of the females marrying outside. They had to stay inside Israel where the men could take from outside Israel and bring them in. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then, of so, course, you already mentioned that men who came into Israel as sojourners or um, get, came in and converted or however the, the process that they joined themselves to Israel, then it was two or three generations, three generations or four before they could be part of the assembly, which would right. give them full recognition and having mm -hmm. a voice in mm -hmm. the assembly. But wow, right. all that's, that's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. Um, so they go on a little bit further and they say, um, you know, despite major advances in genetics, many questions remain about how some traits are inherited. Uh, we know that the features uh, we know that features uh, that run in families are not just influenced by the genes that are passed down from parents to their children. Various non-genetic inheritance mechanisms make it possible for maternal and paternal environmental factors to influence characteristics of a child. Right. So, man, that's that's so your community, your whole environment is 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 nurtures. It's the combination of nurture and nature. Right. Your your environment plays a huge role, your genetics. Right. But then your environment is really important. And we in modern science, we don't really look at environment as much. We are just now getting into the study of epigenetics to the point where we say, wow, you know, your, your nurture is really, uh, really playing a huge role, if not greater than the actual genes themselves. Wow. Yeah. So, so it's really, really eye opening stuff here. Uh, and moving on, they say, uh, in the flies, for example, it has been shown that males that are well fed as uh, larvae go on to produce big offspring. Uh, our new findings, uh, take this to a whole nother, uh, to a whole new level showing that males can also transmit some of his acquired features to uh, offspring sired by other males. So this is what you were just saying before about, you know, Hebrew men, if he took a war by, he could do that. But the women could not do that uh, for this very biological reason, you know, so you can you can kind of see that coming out in the um, in the research here. This is this is you can hear it. Right. This is this sounds familiar to us. Uh, the idea of telegyny. Uh, or uh, telegony, uh, that a male can leave a mark. That's, that's, that's an important statement, that a male can leave a mark on his mate's body that influences her offspring to a different male, um, originated with the Greek philosopher, as I stated before, Aristotle. And it was uh, a concern to royalty in the 1300s and still popular as a uh, scientific hypothesis in the 1800s, but rejected in the early 1900s as incompatible with the new, uh, you know, science of genetics. But now they're finding mm. out that that new science may not have had all the answers as what was older. 
and a fascinating side piece that I haven't looked into. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But of course, you know, where in the world would Aristotle get this kind of idea? <laughs> and he, uh, you know, obviously was a thinker and a philosopher, but we also go into the Greek backgrounds and we see everything going into the Greek gods. And that may be connected to um, the you could call it the the fallen angels you could call mm -hmm. it uh, nephilim but the uh, chimerism and all the other pieces that go with that which led to quote unquote ancient wisdoms that i think are probably more real than not <laughs> right 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 um, and and so he would have you know somewhere in there through some of the stories that came along he understood something that only now modern science that has the ability to do what it can do can go back and go wait a minute this is true. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. So, um, so I, I find that to be uh, really pretty fascinating. Um, there was another article here that I didn't get a chance to share, share with you, but, and I, and I don't have it here, but it talks about telegeny and uh, some of the uh, research that went on in Europe, in Russia. Uh, and they found some really interesting things in humans. You know, we were dealing with uh, flies and fruit flies uh, here, but the original, a lot of the original research uh, dealt with um, those who were horse breeders and horse breeders would oftentimes see this play out in actuality when they were breeding, you know, thoroughbreds and breeding horses. Uh, they really saw and uh, testified to this uh, uh, telegony effect that it was something very real uh, in uh, horses for sure. And mm. so I, so I think that that's something that, um, uh, we certainly keep on the agenda for uh, future discussions. I'll have some more that, that uh, I'll see you later, but um, it's an interesting uh, topic, but I think it does really show a scientific parallel with what script the laws and the wisdom and the testimonies that scripture gives from the Torah about how to operate in terms of marriage, divorce, and what have you um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining a consistency uh to your tribes right to the culture all right so very good stuff very very interesting stuff so let's uh, let, let's take a second here and sum up and then if we if you want to keep going we'll keep going because i know we've got a few more articles here mm -hmm. but sort of to sum up of course the uh the the topic and you know it's a it, it's it's not entirely clickbait but it's somewhat clickbait but women need sex and yeah. so you talked about the fact that um, there are many benefits that are within the um, the male seminal fluid that um, are mind altering, that are mood altering, that uh, help determine the the welfare, the mental welfare and the state of well-being that a woman has. Mm -hmm. um, but then what we did was we went on where we're talking about, yes, women need sex, but there's a, you know, we need to understand that it's within the right context and the right context isn't just every Joe that's walking by. Cause that is a real problem. Now, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you're full of uh, all sorts of competing seed, if you will, mm -hmm. that, uh, that um, I think some of these other um, articles that we would look at if, uh, if we keep going, mm -hmm. will demonstrate that that stuff then has significant detrimental effect on a woman um, by having a lot of competing seed going on. Never mind the fact that it uh, that it creates problems with lineage. Um, going back to Leverett marriage, you don't want her going into another tribe or into another family or wherever else. Keep her as close. And I don't think mm -hmm. it was it was limited simply to a blood brother, but it's going to be the next nearest kin or the next nearest relative. Um, and in doing so, you're getting minimally like mindedness. Most likely you're getting same diet background. You're getting same um, same genetic, uh, you know, some of the genes that are coming down through the genetic distribution. So uh, all of that stuff remains somewhat the same instead of having this confusion introduced into our body mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and into the lineage. So what else? No. All right. So one thing I, I thought would be really good. Let's see. Um, we may have to edit this part out, but uh, 
let's go ahead and go to one of our, our home run articles here. This was an article that, uh, you know, I had heard about this research before and, uh, and I happened to, uh, to find it a, a few years back. And I was like, man, this is a home run. And this was, uh, the article that, um, uh, women retain the DNA of every man ever slept with in their bodies. Okay. So we're, we'll go ahead and pull up this, uh, home run article here. Uh, and we'll take a look at it. Let's see if I'm able to. So to to reiterate what I said a minute ago, we've demonstrated that women need a man, need sex, but they don't need a lots of men. They need a man. And this uh, this this also exactly goes into why um, why scripture is very specific about. It, it, there's no provision for a woman to divorce a man. Uh, there's no um, provision for a woman really to leave a man even, uh, except in, I think, the case of, or he, he can divorce her, Deuteronomy 24, in the case of fornication or something of that sort, some uncleanness, I'll put it that way. Um, God's design is for a woman to be with one man for life. Right. To, to stick with him, there should only be one. You know, that way there's no confusion there. But go ahead. This next article is that uh, the title of it is uh, Women Retain and Carry Living DNA uh, from Every Man uh, Who uh, They Have Had Sexual Intercourse With, According to the Study uh, by a University of Seattle and uh, the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center. So right off the bat, uh, it says something that... Uh, we have not heard in the West. What what we're hearing here is uh, something that is really going to support what we find in Scripture. Uh, so we'll we'll start with the first uh, uh, part of this here, and it says uh, the study uh, which discovered the startling information by accident. Okay, this that's always how it's discovered by accident. Uh, was originally trying to determine if women who have been pregnant with a son. Uh, might be more uh, predisposed to certain neurological diseases uh, that occur more frequently in males. Okay, uh, but as scientists picked apart uh, the fe uh, the female brain, the study began to veer wildly off course. As it turns out, the female brain is even more mysterious than we previously thought. Uh, the study found that female brains often harbor, get this, my uh, male microchimerisms. Okay, so we'll stop right there. Microchimerisms are basically uh, fragments of DNA, fragments of DNA. So we're we're beyond now the point of initially when we first started, we were talking about seminal fluid and proteins that are in the seminal fluid that are not DNA. Okay, just the proteins, the surrounding environment uh, had a, a, a heavy effect uh, on uh, the biology of the female of any species. But now in this study, we have gone to humans and now we're dealing directly with uh, male fragments of DNA, fragments of DNA. And so what you're about to hear is, is really gonna be uh, eye-opening in terms of uh, what we've been talking about. So uh, the female brain often harbors uh, male microchimerism. So that's what microchimerism is, these small fragments of living DNA that somehow continue to stay alive, continue to exchange information with the host tissue. Okay, so I want you to know that's chimera, right? In Greek mythology, a chimera was something that was half one thing, half another thing, uh, maybe a little bit of this, maybe a little bit of that, okay? But that's where that word chimera comes from, right? Uh, so, uh, so what they found out when they uh, we're doing the research that these these autopsy specimens, the female brains were that they contain these male microchimerisms or in other words, the presence of male DNA that originated from another individual and are genetically distinct from the cells uh, that make up the rest of the woman. OK, so so what they were they found this DNA. They're like, wow, this this is not DNA from this woman. And it's not even a woman's DNA. And so the question now becomes, where is this coming from? Okay, could the ancients be correct? Could Hebrew culture, could the Torah given uh, uh, to uh, Moshe uh, uh, by Yah, could that be 
telling us something. So let's let's go a little bit further. According to according to the study, 63% of the females uh, test uh, tested harbored male microchimerisms in the brain. Okay, uh, male microchimerism was present in multiple brain regions, so not just in one little spot. Wow, all over the place. Okay, multiple areas. So uh, and it says this. So. Now, um, <laughs> A, a quick question. Back to the beginning of the article, were were they studying only brain tissue, or is that just the place that it was primarily being found? Yeah. Well, or is that the most the 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 place that affects them the most? Well, you know what happened. What happened originally? So it started off as just neurological research, right? So they they were looking okay. at people who may have had Alzheimer's, may have had other neurological uh, diseases, Huntington's disease, different uh, brain. Uh, diseases. And, and they were just looking to see like, hey, you know what, in women, you know, you know, you know, these diseases may have a, a higher occurrence in men, but we're finding them in women. Uh, maybe it came from male fetus and maybe some of those cells lodged into the, the mother and technically caused her to develop this later in life. So this is where they originally were starting. So they were looking at brains. So they were looking at brains. They were evaluating neurology, uh, trying to figure out disease processes. Uh, in female brains for certain disorders, right? And um, and so then they came up. So in in just starting doing this research on the female brain, they started to test the DNA of the female brains, evaluating for some type of mutations or what have you. And they kept seeing all this male DNA pop up in these female brains. Like, where is this coming from? Right. And that's how that whole thing uh, started from from the way they kind of introduced this. And um, from what I know of the process, and it goes on, it says, um, so 63% of, uh, of women carry male DNA cells that lived in their brain. So this is not dead DNA. This is living DNA. Wow. This is living DNA. So it's exchanging information. It's incorporated itself into the living tissue of the female host. It's living, it's changing, it's determining, it's growing living cells, living DNA. Uh, obviously, the researchers wanted to know uh, where the male DNA came from. Anyone care to guess, right? There's, there's a little bit of satire uh, in the author here. Anyone care to guess uh, from the woman's, woman's father? No. Your father's DNA combines with your mother's DNA to create your unique DNA. Uh, so where else could it come from is the question, right? So this is the question. Uh, through the study, the researchers assumed that the most likely answer was that all male DNA uh, found in living female brain came from a male pregnancy. Okay. All right. So that's, this is a politically correct answer. This is what they even thought. They said, okay, this is correct. We'll be okay with this. Uh, but they were living in denial uh, because when they autopsied the brains of women who had never been pregnant, surprise, surprise, let alone uh, with one male child, they still found male DNA uh, cells prevalent in the female brain. How did it get there? She didn't even have a male fetus. So you can't argue spontaneous abortion. You can't, that's a small percentage of people. You can't, argue, you know, could it be a regular abortion, what have you not, it's still a very small percentage. Women who had not even uh, had male pregnancies had this abundance of male DNA in their brain. And so it says at this point, the scientists didn't know uh, what was going on. Uh, confused, they did their best to hide the information until they could understand, and explain it, and and explain it. So, uh, in research papers, right, they have multiple uh, sections of research papers, and then buried in the section, uh, they actually came to a really, uh, a really um, pinpoint statement. And and this is what they probably knew this up front, but they didn't want to go all the way with this. So this oh, is, of course not. This is going <laughs> to blow some stuff up. No, this this is going to confirm Tor in a in an amazing uh, way. So it says conclusion: male microchimerism was not uh, was not infrequently uh, or infrequent in women without sons. Okay, so that's the first uh, point. Besides known pregnancies, other possible sources of male microchimerism include unrecognized spontaneous abortion. Uh, vanishing uh, male twins, which is a process where you have twins and then, you know, one of the baby doesn't survive and gets reabsorbed by the uh, womb. Um, uh, maybe an older brother, maybe there was a brother that she gave birth to previously and he left some cells behind. We know that that certainly does hap uh, can happen. Um, and, uh, and then 
here they also say, or sexual intercourse. Okay, male microchimerism was significantly more frequent and uh, levels were higher in women with induced abortion than in women with other pregnancy histories. So this is something here. This is something, and, and, and the next article we'll have will kind of tie into that here, but induced abortions had a way of releasing way more uh, DNA cells, way more uh, uh, microchimerism into the bloodstream, into the body, than natural pregnancy processes. So that's something yeah. you, you have to keep in mind now. And now we have to find out, is microchimerism good or bad? That's going to be the, the 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 question of the day as we go further uh, with what we find in in the research here. So, according to the scientists, uh, the possible sources sources of the male DNA cells living uh, in the woman's brain are number one, an abortion that the woman doesn't know about, a male twin that vanished, an older brother that transferred some of his cells into the maternal circulation, or sexual intercourse. Considering the fact that 63% now, the, this is a high number, 63% of the women have male DNA residing in the recesses of their brain, which which of the above possibilities do you think is the most likely origin mm -hmm. of that DNA, right? Mm -hmm. We know that spontaneous abortions that a woman doesn't know about is a very rare thing, okay? Uh, vanishing twins, extremely rare, rare. An older brother, leaving uh, uh, DNA behind, certainly possible, but not, you know, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen at the level that would produce a 63% in all these autopsy uh, specimens. The answer is four, and he goes down and he says sex. Uh, this has very important ramifications for women. Every male you abs absorb spermatozoa or sperm uh, from becomes a living part of your life. Okay. So that statement right there is a take home statement. Uh, you know, as you know, we hear some brothers talk about soul ties and, and how, you know, when you come into the truth, you know, uh, and you accept, uh, Yahusha, he has to heal you not only spiritually, but with that spiritual healing and with the, the word being placed in your heart as a seed helps you grow and gives life to you through the Ruach to actually clean you up. And I think that's an important, uh, uh, message to be left here that every, every exposure leaves cells behind and those cells are not dead cells. They are living. Okay. Um, the women autopsied uh, in the study were elderly women. Now that's 63% of elderly women. And we're not talking about modern uh, culture or necessarily modern women. These are elderly women. This article, if I'm not correct, it was written back in, I think, 2017. Uh, I'm not sure if it's up there. Is it 16 or 17? I'm not yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go back. We can go back and look right quick. Yeah. I think it's right, right, way up at the top. I don't. Uh, uh, this was 20, uh, June 24th, 2017. Yep. Okay. Okay. So there, yeah, so that, that's important. So, um, so they were elderly, uh, women, some have been carrying living male DNA inside of them for well over 50 years. Okay. Um, spermatozoa, they're, they're alive. Sperm is alive. It's a living cell when it's injected into uh, you, it swims and it swims and it crashes headlong into a wall in the body. And then it attaches and burrows itself into your flesh. Ah, that makes you think of Genesis 2.24, right? And the two shall become one flesh, right? Literally, mm -hmm. in science, that the flesh merges here. This is, this is a really heavy statement. The, the, the male cells are actually living and become part of the female here. And they're living cells. It's one flesh now. They're functioning as one unit. Uh, if it's in, and, and he goes further, he, he becomes um, more detailed. He said, if it's in your mouth, it climbs through your nasal passage, inner ear, behind your ear, then it goes into your bloodstream, into your brain, and into your very spinal cord, right? So it, it, uh, it will function literally the way that you think, okay? Um, uh, like something, out, and then he makes a little comment here, uh, like dealing with a sci-fi uh, movie is something you can't get rid of. 
<laughs> so there's some powerful ramifications here for sexual intercourse. And so once again, science proves uh, or supports or confirms Torah, the gift right. that the Father had already given us. Right. And and this is one of those things, I think, too, that we can sort of see, I, I think, almost common knowledge. We sort of recognize this in the world around us because— how often do we look at a couple that's been married to, you know, uh, you know, a man and woman that have been married for 50 years and they start to have some, some similarities in their resemblance. Yes. Yes. Uh, very common with that or conversely go the opposite way. And a woman that has been really promiscuous typically gets, uh, gets, uh, you can, you can pick it out. It's just this real hardened look that takes on some heavy features um, yes, that yes. I think, you know, the average person can, can look at and go, Oh, that's somebody who's been around. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there's something going on genetically that, that actually works almost as a confirmation that we pick yes. up on subconsciously when we look at somebody and go, Oh, they've been together for a long time or, mm -hmm. Ooh, she's been around a few times. Right. Right. Um, right. And all of that is related to this very thing the mm -hmm. DNA that is being stored. And in the first case, it's all from one source and it continues to bind them together. As we saw in the other articles with the benefits, the beneficial things that she receives, where in the other it's receiving it from all these different sources. And now they're in conflict with each other and crashing into this hardened, you know, it, it altered appearance altering anyway you understand what i'm saying yes yes and and i i uh most certainly agree with you as well uh with that and and there's research out there that uh talks about uh, just overexposure to male microchimerism uh which certainly can um lead to and and now with the research going on recently that that can certainly too much microchimerism or an abnormal amount like that you would get exposed to can uh, lead uh, potentially allegedly to chronic illness or autoimmune disorders. Mm. Right? And so what they've seen ever since the 70s and some of the research that I've seen uh, that ever since the 70s and you, you think about what happened socially in the 70s, ever since you had certain revolutions and certain aspects of the culture, you've seen a just increase of of women having autoimmune disorders to the point now where when you look at the total of autoimmune diseases in the uh, in the West, at least, uh, it's 80% are, are women. Right. You sent me an article yeah. on that. Yes. Yeah. 80% are women. So the question is, and they've seen that increase, right? It was very, uh, it, it was very static uh, before the 1970s. And then at the beginning of 1970s on up, it's increased. And so now with this uh, evidence that microchimerism can certainly, uh, uh, a, a woman can be exposed to multiple micro, male microchimerisms uh, from different men, uh, you know, certainly now the link to that and autoimmunity or chronic illness or chronic disease, and the fact that chronic disease and illness in women has been increasing since the 70s, is there a link there, right? And, yeah, I, you know, a, you don't question. <laughs> you're right. Right. Is there a link there with that? You know, when you have change in culture, right? 70s mark the sexual revolution. You have significant changes in culture. Uh, we leave from our uh, more of a puritanical type of culture. The 1950 culture goes away. Uh, we have more of a uh, free and open society when it comes to sexual norms. And what happens? You see this massive increase in autoimmunity. And we now we find out that microchimerism can certainly uh, uh, is 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 being listed as a potential cul culprit in uh, autoimmunity and chronic illness. So this 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 is not necessarily something you see in the news, but this is in the research. This is certainly in the research. So very interesting. Yeah, but they'll guard their sexual promiscuity. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but it's something that ancient ways, the ancient cultures right. were very protective. Right. And you don't see that in certain cultures all over the world now that still practices, that still hold on to various laws of chastity and what have you. You don't see that same occurrence of chronic illness 
uh, to that extent, not even close, right? So, uh, so very interesting. Um, the next article I thought we should go to just to kind of show this point with my chimerism, we'll kind of dig into that a little bit more. You know, I wanted to do um, this uh, a study uh, that shows abortion may cause chronic disease, okay? So, um, you know, I, I think that's a good one for us to kind of look at because we need to see that, you know, if you're, if you're stopping a normal biological process, um, do, are there side effects that you don't know about that, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be like, oh, yeah, that was wrong, right? But if we look at the ancient cultures, if we look at the Torah, it, you know, the Torah told us, hey, yay or nay on these things uh, for, mo for multiple millennia. So, uh, so this I is am, something we should I'm certainly looking look to at. see if I've got that article in here. I, I, uh, I've got a whole bunch of open tabs here, and I'm trying to okay. sort through and find. Do you know what the title of it is? Or you have to yeah, the, the the title of it is uh, "Studies Show Abortion May Cause Chronic Disease." I and do not think I you have, don't have that one. one. Okay, was, was that in our Telegram? I think it is in our telegram. It's down. It's right, closer well, to the bottom. Stand by and let me see if I can find that right quick. And I may be able to pull that link up and open it. I've got to find our show notes uh, discussion here. All right. I am scrolling. Well, what else can you share share with well, us well, while I'm trying to find yeah, this here? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see here. But yeah, so I, 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 I you know, I, I think the one thing we're, this is very heavy information, very, um, uh, you know, uh, mentally challenging information for those who may just be finding out about, uh, you know. Uh, the father's law, statutes and commandments, his standards. Um, and they may have, uh, you know, uh, had some negative experiences um, uh, concerning these matters that we're talking about. And I would just encourage uh, anyone who has had that, any uh, women or who have experienced these things to um, present it to the father in faith on the blood of Yahusha and uh you know ask for him to wipe away all your experiences and to heal you um you know one thing that i've i've heard uh said many times in many circles is that you know uh there is in modern culture there's not a lot of people who may have had a chance to grow up knowing these things and having proper covering and what have you but your life starts at the point in time uh when you accept uh yahusha as savior and when you welcome him into your life. And uh, from that point, you move forward. You can't go erase the past. You can't uh, go deal with whatever happened in the past. But what you can do is move forward, uh, receive the benefits of his grace, and uh, live starting all over again um, from day one in him. And so that's the one thing that I would encourage uh, people, uh, uh, women, young ladies, older uh, uh, women, uh, you name it, I would say that uh, in him, he can, uh, you can become a new creature and go forward uh, from day one uh, by faith in him. And this is the article? Yes. Let's see here. Yeah, that's it right there. Pregnancy news. Yep, that's it. You got it right there. So, okay. Um, just wanted to kind of take a look at this. Now we were talking about microchimerism, and, uh, and 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 the role that that plays. So the question is: Is microchimerism healthy? Is it not healthy? Uh, we know from pregnancy, right? If uh, you know, I, you know, if my uh, Shia had another child there and she had a son, there is going to be natural microchimerism just simply because uh, the male fetus will leave some uh, cells behind. In his mother, that's a that's a known thing, um, and that certainly happens. But the question is, 
and, and, and we see that pregnancy is actually very beneficial to women in terms of long-term health. They have lower rates of cancer, lower rates of uh, uh, mental illness, uh, um, uh, different diseases uh, that will affect women who have not had children. So we, we mm. know that those cells uh, are very protective in general. But the question is, what if you get too many um, cells from different men all mixed in, does it cause an abnormal reaction there? And uh, we need to study that. If you get it too much of those cells, too many of those cells in abnormal ways. Okay, so that's the next question we have to kind of look at. Um, so in this study, it says a study, um, a study shows that abortion may cause chronic disease, chronic disease, okay? Uh, multiple medical studies say abortion may trigger chronic lifelong diseases in women. Uh, if this was uh, about any other medical procedure, it would be making headlines, okay? Um, alerting women uh, that saying no to abortion uh, can, pro uh, can protect their health. So, so you're not gonna find this kind of article in the mainstream news, that's, that's basically what they're saying. According to a study published uh, in the International Journal of Clinical and e Experimental Medicine, okay? So this is a big time journal. This is a big time scientific journal. Uh, this is not something that is just, you know, uh, something that was on some news channel or, or fake news. This is a big time international scientific journal. And it's, uh, and the, in the journal, a study said that uh, abortion leaves behind fetal cells that can trigger chronic autoimmune diseases. It's called fetal microchimerism. And it occurs when fetal cells uh, in the unborn baby's circulatory system travels into the mother's bloodstream, okay? Uh, multiple medical studies uh, say abortion may trigger this. So this is a, another tweet came out that somebody was uh, saying as well too. So if we go down uh, to the next paragraph, it says, the process begins in the fourth or fifth week after fertilization. The presence of fetal microchimerism can be detected in the mother's bloodstream up to 30 days after birth. So, 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 so that brings me to another point in Torah. The woman, for a female, um, you know, for a, a a male fetus, or you know, when she gave birth to a male, how long did she have to wait during her cleansing period? Thirty-three days. <laughs> okay, okay. So you see here, thirty days, right? You can detect these cells in the stream of the mother. So I'm just showing you a correlation. Sure, Whether sure, sure. Because I, I I just remember that a female was twice that, which was always was twice always interestingly debated every time we come across that in the uh, in the Torah. It's like why why this why that they, you know and nobody really has a good explanation or explanation answer, for right? it right. But yeah, I just I'm found curious. it to be really interesting when I was yes. reading that. Oh, yeah. really? Right. So yeah. so it says up to thirty days after uh, the uh, birth, miscarriage, or abortion. Okay, but the risk doesn't end there. Uh, the cells graft to the mother's bone marrow and other tissue throughout her body and have been detected 27 years postpartum. Wow. Okay. So this is, this is major. So when you, you know, you, you have uh, in, women in the culture, if you have multiple abortions, right? I've seen that in the parent culture that I came from. I came from a community where, you know, the young ladies were having multiple abortions. Mm. Uh, so, so you think about all that exposure to microchimerism and how long it potentially can stay in your system, okay? Um, researchers say uh, the way in which the pregnancy, a pregnancy will end will impact the number of fetal uh, microchimeric uh, cells that are uh, believed to trigger autoimmune disease. The higher the number of cells, the more risk to the mother. Well, you already oh, told us abortion generates the highest. The highest, yeah, abortion generates more yeah. microchimeric cells Wow. Than a natural miscarriage or birth. That's mind wow. blowing. So it's really putting you at risk for significant disease activity mm. uh, there. Uh, abortion considerably increases the uh, health risk for women, particularly uh, surgical abortion in the first or second trimester. The reason is uh, that the violent uh, surgical DNC uh, process basically destroys the placenta. Uh, and the baby's body in the process, which results in more fetal tissue traveling through the mother's bloodstream everywhere, basically, okay? Mm. Um, so you're just gonna get a lot of uh, exposure to those uh, damaged uh, products, right? 
a woman loses more than uh, half her baby in a, an abortion. Okay, so I just go into some of those details. Um, also, uh, she also loses uh, the suppressions of ma maternal immune system, which may trigger an onset of an autoimmune disease. Uh, okay, according mm -hmm. to the research, fetal uh, microchimeric cells generate generated from the first or second trimester uh, from a first or second trimester abortion pose the greatest risk of developing a chronic lifelong autoimmune uh, disease in the mothers. The majority of abortions done uh, in America are in the first trimester. So they're just giving you, giving you a lot of information here, right? Um, the study uh, concluded that the consistent, listen, the consistently rising incident of autoimmune diseases in women over the past four decades, where we were just talking about, uh, may be attributed to the increase in the utilization of abortion. Uh, this study isn't a rogue attempt to politically uh, taint uh, the image of abortion. A growing body of evidence support this theory. A 2018 study uh, published in the International Journal of Critical Illness and Injury Science. So these are major journals. Uh, concluded that abortion is strongly associated with new diagnosis of hypothyroidism in females. Wow. Okay. Uh, another, this, this is, they're just major, art. these are major articles. Um, another uh, published in obstetrics and gynecology found that fetal DNA in 22% of women uh, who had given birth uh, versus 57% of women uh, who, <laughs> look at the number, 57% of women who underwent an induced surgical abortion. So the percentage was much higher. So if you had the normal process, the normal guy given process of birth, kept the numbers down low. But when you go and induce uh, or man-made forced abortion there, you it get a lot more. It uh, Yes, nearly triples. The study reported the incident of microchimerism is extremely high in women with a history of abortion. Uh, the abortion uh, industry and its political supporters uh, have dismissed out uh, of hand any medical uh, or scientific evidence, no matter how credible it is. And these are major journals. These are major journals hmm. um, that they are just really not uh, sharing in terms of uh, detrimental to women. So so this is uh, this opinion piece here. Uh, and it's not an opinion piece. This is really just flat out major medical journals that are all coming to the same conclusion that confirm what Torah has always said, right? So I, I find this to be um, very eye-opening. Hmm. Well, Any the thoughts? consequences to doing, you, you know, to, to committing sin, and I would, I, I would consider terminating or ending or killing an unborn child to be high on that list of things that would generate consequences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. I think for the most part, um, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts? And I, it, for the major articles, I think we, we've kind of gone through the major meat that I wanted to kind of pass through, unless there was another article you wanted to. I think there's one other that I would love for you to yeah. touch on. And this actually hits it kind of from a slightly different direction. I, I will go ahead and pull this up, yeah, but pull this not, one up to, not to surprise you, <laughs> you, you sent it to me. Um, <laughs> women, premarital sex. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Let me. Uh, and you know, this, this sort of yes. supports the other side because some might say, well, you know, I've never had an abortion, you know, and I've always been really careful and use contraception, whatever. Yes. No, just uh, <laughs> just the fact that that women that women need sex. We go back to the very beginning. They need to have. Um, and, and there's a there's another point that we'd like to discuss, I think, just beyond this article. They need to have the beneficial effect of the male essence. I love the way you yes. term that. Um, they need that, but they need it within the within the boundaries, the boundaries. of what God says is is good for them. Because when they operate outside of those boundaries, there are consequences. And this this article delves into some of those consequences. Yes, so, yes, absolutely. We'll we'll definitely go with this one. Uh, so uh, the name of this article was "Women, Premarital Sex, and Divorce." So the study uh, unpacks some surprises here. Okay, so 
you know, remember we're in a Western uh, cultural mindset. So the question is, um, is there any link to premarital sex, uh, divorce? Uh, are there any negative outcomes? How does that uh, uh, how does that play out uh, in in uh, real life uh, with women here, uh, especially when we're looking at the West here? So, um, so let's take a look at this. So this article was in 2016. So what? Side note, what's so funny to me? It seems like between uh, 2015 to 2020, there were a lot of bombshell articles that kind of came out and uh, ex ex exposed a lot of material there. So I, I find that to be an interesting time frame for uh, research that actually supports what uh, Hebraic culture and Torah has always taught, uh, you know, for, for eons there. So, uh, so let's take a look at this. It says the um, University of Utah professor uh, Nicholas uh, Wolfinger unpacked some surprises uh, or some surprise findings in his examination of a woman's premarital sex uh, biography and the chances of divorce uh, in the first five years of marriage. Uh, but uh, what about marital quality? So he, he kind of delves off into that. Now we know um, that um, some of the major causes for divorce in general, uh, we know, you know, for years it used to be number one cause was, you know, religious differences. Uh, I think number two or number three uh, was uh, financial uh, difficulties, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so th those were traditionally, you know, even when I was testing for my boards years ago, 20 years ago, um, those were always on the exams um, as, you know, what were the major causes of, of, of divorce. But this is telling us a different story uh, 20 years later. So we'll, let's take a look at this and see what, what and, we come up and with. And what it may be telling us is that people blame it on on something <laughs> more, you know, that they're more honest with what they're saying instead of actually what it gets blamed on. But Right, what it gets blamed on. Right, right. So let's take a look here. It says uh, women who are virgins, uh, when they marry, are less likely to divorce within five years than those who uh, have multiple partners before marriage. Next likely to divorce are those who had one premarital uh, partner, okay? So the first thing is that uh, virgins less likely, so they're dealing with five year periods of time, uh, virgins less likely to get divorced. Uh, those who have had uh, multiple partners, uh, you know, very high likelihood that they'll get divorced. And then even if you had one premarital partner, um, you're at risk for uh, divorce within those five years in terms in, in, to a greater uh, degree. Uh, after that, the number is not so straightforward. According to new analysis uh, that uh, delivers what sociologist uh, Wolfinger calls counterintuitive surprises. Wolfinger is a professor of family and customer and uh, consumer studies uh, and uh, an adjunct professor of sociology at the University of Utah uh, and co-author of the book Soulmates. I haven't looked at his book, but that, that's interesting. Um, his findings were published in a research brief uh, for the Institute of Family Studies. Acceptance of premarital relationships, so this is his lead statement, acceptance of premarital relationships uh, has grown over uh, the decades. And the number of women who were virgins uh, when they married dropped uh, each decade since the uh, 1970s. So I just brought up the 1970s concerning abortions and so you know, right along the lines, he's talking about just just uh, those who have kept virginity. So in uh, the 1970s, it was 21%. And in the uh, 2010s there, it dropped down to 5%. Uh, religion seems to explain why women who marry as virgins have lower dis divorce rates, um, says Wolfinger. So right off the bat, he's giving uh, props uh, or support to religious, uh, you know, principles that keep women married. Okay. So that's the read between the lines of that statement. I, I, I would, I would ask, you know, maybe he's pointing at religion, but is it religion or is it, is it just the fact that they have religion or is it because they're in a particular religious practice or is it because through religion they've been, um, 
inculcated with the idea to preserve their virginity and the preserved virginity leads to greater bonding between the woman and the man that she marries um which results in lower divorce rate hmm. that's a great statement i think he tries to touch on it a little bit more on the next sentence where he says today in america virgin marriage appears to be solely the domain of the religious okay so somehow he's connect he's connecting religious religious values right it, to me it almost sounds like he's saying yeah you know these values of virgin marriage is something that you can find in the religious domain solely you don't find it outside of the religious cultures that that's well, yeah and, it almost and, and sounds like he's saying in, in in christianity at large and and even more so in the hebraic and torah keeping communities um virginity is is extolled though mm -hmm. i'm not sure it's extolled as much in m a large Modern parts Christendom. of the of the uh, more liberal christian mm -hmm. denominations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i know when when we were coming up you and i probably being about the same age mm -hmm. uh, it, it was something that was that was c talked about often it was uh considered a, a a mark of we would say righteousness right right um, right and yet from a scriptural standpoint, scripture doesn't just extol it. It it, <laughs> it holds in, in the highest regard. A man, right. you know, a father who has a daughter should do everything he can to protect her her purity. And yep. that purity was valued such that um, the bride price was considerably more for a virgin. Why? Absolutely. Because well, mul multiple reasons we've already seen. The the woman is not going to, or the man's not going to be having to compete with the seed of another man. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to deal with the weight and the the challenges that come with microchimerism that has come from other sources. You mm -hmm. don't have all of the all of the the extra baggage. Instead, you're dealing with a clean slate, and she can more easily and readily bond and mold to you, the man. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And like our first article said that, that, you know, when she bonds to you, then she has a direct interest in the development of your clan, mm. you, you know, a direct interest, you know, when you, when that bonding take place, not just spiritually, but it's physical in every sense of the word, uh, then the very fluid that the man produces, the very essence of the man given to her, not only one flesh is her, but then gives her a buy in. She now has a direct buy in to the mm. development of that home, to the development of that house. Right. That's which which is God's intent from the beginning. Told yeah, Adam, absolutely. he did not tell Hava. She was not there. It was not until after after God told him to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over the earth. He had a mission and he was told how to go about doing it. And then he was given a help meet and her job in doing that or her she being brought onto the scene for the purpose of helping him accomplish that has you know they're becoming one flesh makes her or gives her that buy-in and part of his purpose and his vision absolutely absolutely uh yeah amazing amazing but very very biblical very torah it, it, it fits nicely in what we have always understood about Hebraic mm. culture. Perfect. Fits perfectly. And now we're just seeing the science support it. Right. right? Science right. just now catching up with it. Right. Right. And uh, interesting. So he goes on to say uh, that today in America, the virgin marriage, uh, virgin marriage appears to be solely the domain of the religious. He says adding religious people uh, are also less likely to divorce. Okay. Uh, women who have had two sex partners prior to marriage have consistently had higher divorce rates within five years, even uh, even in comparison to those with uh, higher number of partners. Uh, I think there was a little typo there, but that's what he's saying. Um, people who uh, people with two uh, premarital partners are more likely to divorce than those with uh, three or nine. So I find that interesting right here uh, where he says that. Uh, you know, from the research that he's been conducting here, that if they have only had two, uh, they're more likely to divorce uh, than those who have just go ahead and said, you know, hey, we're going to have more than that. 
but but he gives well, an interesting it, it, reasoning here it, for his, that. His his theory a little bit farther along probably bears a, a fair amount of weight. Yes. Um, so what we see is virgin is least likely to divorce. Mm -hmm. One partner prior to marriage is is a little bit more likely. Mm -hmm. Two is a lot more likely, and then progressively less and less with three or more, yes. which seems counterintuitive. But ultimately, what he what he says, if you if you yeah, know, we read down, get on down to it, yeah. And he says here, um, only recently has the divorce rate uh, been highest among. Uh, women with 10 or more premarital partners uh, than among those who have had only two. But the difference is so slight, it's not statistically significant, uh, Wolfinger said. Uh, the big story is uh, the finding that two partners uh, who have uh, pretty much the highest uh, consistent divorce rate, the big finding is that um, pretty much that the highest consistent divorce rate is those who have two partners. Uh, that's what was surprising to him, just the two partner one. So he right. gives this theory and he says, uh, it may be the case of the one who got away. OK, uh, presumably uh, the woman married uh, one of her uh, two premarital partners, uh, but the other creates an overemphasized comparison. Um, so basically the one who got away and she kind of lingers for that one who who got away and can't focus on the one who she has. Uh, it's like a uh, historical romance no novel where the woman is agonizing between the two su suitors. Uh, the second one is the viable option. So he kind of theorizes that, and that makes that makes sense. Well, it, that, and you start thinking too about the fact that um, her uh, her experience level has two, or you know, I guess the two or two previous partners plus the one that she's married to. So she's got three. And the thought is, is maybe is that after you have more after that, it gets to be like, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal or it's not that big of a difference or whatever um, in terms of how she then views men. And so she's more likely maybe to hang around with one in spite of the troubles. Right. Um, but still, it you know, what what what's the thing that the woman should be doing? Because you get to the other end of that scale, you got seven seven participants or eight participants. The other end of that scale, what it looks like is that's where you've got all the microchimerism and yes. you've got all of the medical problems and everything else. So, you know, once you put all the pieces together, where do you really want to be? Right, right. The woman needs to be a virgin. Yeah, should, she should desire to be a virgin because that's what's in her best interest. Both physically, spiritually, economically, you name it. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's all the way down for her. In and, her it's what's in, and it's what's, you know, the, the man that takes her, that's what's in his best interest as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So he, he does something interesting here. So he kind of examines the differences and he says, uh, acceptance of premarital sex has not grown among the very religious. So he kind of makes that classification up front. So people who are religious, religious cultures uh, in the U.S., um, you know, they're they're pretty static on premarital sex. He says, although Americans overall are more accepting. So he kind of makes that distinction right there uh, as he starts examining uh, this, the difference here. He says, after religion, race and, fam race and family of origin had the most impact on the sexual partner slash divorce relationship, uh, uh, Wolfinger said. Caucasian and black women were similar in terms uh, of their sexual behaviors prior to marriage. Hispanic and others uh, had notably fewer sex partners and also lower divorce rates than whites uh, or blacks. Okay, so he's he's looking at the numbers now. He's just going pure numbers. Okay, that's really there's some interesting things there. That's interesting, right? Isn't it, isn't it very yeah. interesting? Um, and uh, you can elaborate on that. Let me let me finish just this uh, section here. It says women who grew up with both both parents uh, had fewer partners. Okay, let's listen, listen to this. So women This who, is important, yes. Yeah, this is important. It says women who grew up with both parents had fewer partners div and divorced less than those who did not grow up uh with both parents. That's 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 enlightening right there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um what what were you gonna say? Did you wanna uh, I, I was yeah. just thinking I, I was considering now I of course I grew up in a Latin culture, I grew up in South America a number mm -hmm. of years. Um and the the Catholic influence in the Hispanic world is significantly higher uh, mm -hmm. than the 
than the religious influence, generally speaking, on both whites and blacks here in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. North America. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably plays into the, the statistics that we have right, right here mm -hmm. is uh, some of that latent culture. It's a subculture that's still heavily Catholic, even if they're not necessarily all attending Catholic mass. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that that may be protecting that. It also, the Hispanic culture also tends to be more patriarchal. And yes. so there's probably some of this heavy leaning of the father to protect the daughter kind of thing. Um, but that's purely speculative. I, I, we'd have to go do some research on that. But the next mm -hmm. sentence is also very interesting because, uh, and I've mentioned this a couple of times on <laughs> my channel, I've got this article that I've had Honestly, the article was written in like 2019 or 2018, uh -huh. Uh -huh. talking about um, why every monogamous or monogamy only culture in the history of the world has failed. And ultimately, it's because statistically that always, always, always leads to single mothers and therefore promiscuity and, and, and yeah. fatherless children. Yeah. And yeah. fatherless girls tend to have greater depression, greater uh, trips, to, you know, more trips mm -hmm. to prison, more promiscuity. Um, and they wind up, you know, and obviously more promiscuity is going to lead to um, to uh, a higher rate of divorce, which, right. you know, plays right into these numbers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where some of those things are mm -hmm. matching up. But again, what is God's design? God's right. design is for man and woman once married mm -hmm. or, you know, I won't get into the discussion that the word marriage is never used in scripture. Once right. she belongs to him, it's for life. And interestingly enough, and this, this heads off in a totally different direction, kind of where, where part of that article would take us if we were to discuss it. And it's a long one. Um, mm -hmm is the fact that the children belong to him, which significantly reduces her motivation to leave. 100%, I would say so, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty deep. And that's how it was. And, in, in, uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, that was certainly the understanding that the children belong to the men, right? When you look at mm -hmm. uh, yep. Europe during the Middle Ages, the children belong to the men. It wasn't until relatively recent, right? Yeah. Maybe like 200 years, uh, you know, at best 250 years where that law started to change a bit and the children became under the supervision of the of the mothers. But for every very long time in Europe and certainly in African cultures, uh, you know, the even, men it, over even in American jurisprudence, the woman belonged to the man until the late 1800s, early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Women mm -hmm. couldn't even conduct um, couldn't even conduct uh, legal proceedings, own property, a lot mm -hmm. of those sorts of things. It was much more similar to what biblical culture says. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of women in the background gasping, oh, you know, the misogyny. <laughs> right, but right. I'm telling you, I'm but, telling but, you, their yeah. lives were better when that was what was going on instead of the, the crazy that we have today with all right. the freedoms and sexual revolution mm -hmm. that come with it. Everything that the that the adversary allows comes with a price. I tell you what, and 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 it's also in the West the the way the family unit was perceived changed. Right when you think about the Eastern cultures and you think about uh, Hebraic culture, the woman did not see herself uh, uh, as uh, an independent entity from the man. Right. Right. Uh, the you know, just like that book uh, uh, called the them, the uh, the them in him. The, yeah. The, uh, the them in him. Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Gina Murray. Yeah. Dr. Murray. Yes. And and, and so you, you look at that. And, and so it wasn't a uh, an offense. You know, if you see yourself as part of the flesh of the husband, as you guys, as one entity, then him performing a function. Uh, of working outside of the house or something as, uh, you know, dealing with administration or representing the household uh, amongst the elders as to what happened down at the gate with Israel, uh, with the elders at the gate, was not an, an affront to her, right? He was representing your interests. Why? Because he is one flesh with you are the same, right? You right. are part right. of the, the same flesh. Right. But in the West, we that has been split asunder, right? 
So you don't have the tribal mindset. And so now you are opposed as opposed to part of. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, you think about it a, a, a different way. You know, it was the house of Jacob. It's the house of uh, um, the house of Judah. It's the house mm -hmm. of Israel. It's the house of Joseph. These are house of David. These are all houses that we see in Scripture. The reference is never to the house of Sarah or the house of Rachel or the right. house of Leah. Right. Now, there are some places that, you know, Rachel is used euphemistically for Ephraim, for the northern kingdom, the house of Ephraim, right? Um, but the, the house doesn't belong to her. Right. She is the help meet that helps to build the house, but the house isn't hers. Right. It's his. Right, right. Absolutely. And you can see the ontological uh, 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 principle for that. You know, if the cells of the man, uh, uh, you know, uh, latch on to and become part of the female, then that's where the concept of, uh, you know, her being under his authority or part of him, he assumes her into him, right? Mm -hmm. Genetically, she becomes part of him, you know? And, uh, and so that's not in Hebraic culture, that wasn't an offense. Uh, you know, you didn't have to be independent of him. You were part of him. Uh, and so I, I just, I find that to be very interesting. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, continuing with this article here, um, I'm going to skip down to where it says since 2000, one third of marriages involving women who had 10 or more uh, premarital partners uh, end in divorce within five years. So 33%, if you've had 10 or more partners, okay, 33% of those for sure will end uh, within five years, the report said. But Wolfinger added a caveat. Uh, this is the result, um, he says, uh, this is the result most readers uh, of this brief expected. Uh, a lot of partners mean a lot of baggage, right? We, you just mentioned that uh, recently, mm -hmm. um, which makes a stable mar marriage less tenable. Uh, it's also entirely likely that the correlation is spurious, so he kind of puts this part in here. He said the product of certain personal character um, is spurious, uh, the product of certain personal characteristics. So he said, you know, it, it may not, it, it could p potentially be for a number of different reasons. He said, for example, people who suffered chi childhood uh, sexual abuse are more likely to have extensive sexual histories. He wrote uh, child abuse uh, also uh, increased the odds of a problematic marriage. So he gives other caveats for the, you know, how you can explain away 10 or more uh, marriage, uh, you know, premarital partners. It may have been for circumstances beyond a woman's control, but that's just still a pretty small um, uh, percentage when you look at everything, but, uh, but he kind of brings that in there. And then he said, he added, uh, this is an extreme example. Most of the time, uh, spuriousness uh, probably has uh, less, has less measurable ca causes. Some people may just have a high level of sexual curiosity, uh, an attribute that doesn't bode well for a stable marriage, at least since the start of the new millennium. So he really puts a lot of caveats in there. And he, he you know, when I'm listening to this, I, I hear him saying, okay, so, you know, something could have caused that sexual curiosity. Maybe it was the culture, maybe it's something else, but he classifies it. He said at the start of the new millennium, you see this stuff breaking, you know, the fire, you know, burning through the house at this point. So this, this is what it sounds like he's saying to me. Um, and then he goes on to say, why have well, a 10 part? And I would, I would additionally say that just as far as sexual curiosity, we've had a lot of things that have been exposed to, to population us. at yes. large. Yes. Um, the advent of the internet and the ability to access all sorts of stuff on the internet too easily. And then now, I mean, just, what what's spoken about on mainstream media has to do with uh, all sorts of sexual promiscuity and yes. uh, deviance and that sort of thing. And so that, mm -hmm. that may be feeding into it, but it's ultimately mm -hmm. um, ultimately it doesn't alter the foundational statement. Virgins stay married, stay married. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, if we go down a little bit uh, more, he says, um, so he, he, he says this, he says, why having 10 or more par uh, partners 
uh, is more problematic than three uh, to nine is not something uh, his analysis explains. Uh, and few of the women uh, had that many uh, premarital sex partners. So uh, out of his study, very few had went to that level. Uh, other research uh, has shown, shown that uh, premarital sex impacts marriage, marital quality. So this will be interesting. Mm -hmm. Our findings uh, were quite in line with what uh, Wolfinger's uh, study found. The number of sexual partners uh, someone had had before marriage was associated with marital quality and a higher number is associated with lower quality uh, across the first two years. Okay, so that's what they looked at. Uh, uh, that this uh, research professor um, of psychology um, evaluated at the University of Denver. Um, she and her colleague uh, explored the impact of premarital uh, experiences on marital quality in a report uh, that was listed as uh, before I do. So I'm sure uh, Elder Pete here will have some of these uh, titles listed uh, for you to kind of peruse. Now that was published in 2014. Uh, by the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. They define marital quality across several measures, including happiness uh, with the marriage, how often, uh, how often conflict or thoughts of divorce arose, and how often the individual uh, confides in his or her mate, uh, Rose said. Uh, they noted that people tend to do better in marriages if they make decisions rather than drifting. Uh, they called it the slide versus the versus the decide so you know men you got to make judgment calls you got to be good leaders i would mm. yeah something that kind of came out to me uh with that you have to have a plan you have to have a vision for your household uh and so it would behoove any brother to really study torah so that they can get that vision uh and know exactly how to lead and the appropriate way to lead um because at the end of the day uh everyone will come to you for answers to the questions mm. So that's, that's one thing that I see with that. Uh, people have a higher quality of marriage and less divorce if they don't move until uh, they have made a formal commitment uh, to be together. Whether it's getting engaged or married, she said, people who drift along and uh, introduce their partner to the kids who then get attached or who have sex early are more apt to find themselves entangled in long-term relationships that are not a good fit, she said. Ooh, if you're hiring, that's it. That's important, right? Yeah, that's pretty heavy. And it says if you're hiring an architect, a lot of experience is a good thing, according to Rhodes. Uh, more experience in relationships may not be. Uh, it means more experience with sex and being and being uh, attracted to someone else, which may not uh, be that helpful in monogamous relationships. Uh, it also means more experience breaking up. Okay, so very, very practical stuff. Yeah, I've I've heard people say just that that dating, the way that the world does dating, is practice for divorce. Right. That's really <laughs> yeah. that's really what you're doing is you're practicing for divorce. For divorce, you're practicing yeah. for divorce. Yeah, and that's and yeah, uh, that's a whole different topic. We just you know the question is, is is the question is 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 dating biblical? It's not. It's not. It's just honestly not. It's not. It's just not. It's not there. It's just Preach. not in the text. Yeah. So, uh, so Rhodes noted that um, these associations are small. It is not the case that if uh, one had ten or more sexual partners, one is uh, most certainly going to get divorced. While risk is higher, there may always be ways to mitigate that risk. It's not an absolute. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, she's given the facts concerning that. And uh, and then so we just kind of finished up with that article. But but those are some really, really good uh, uh, perspectives there in terms of, you know, how do you deal with sexuality? How do you deal with relationships uh, from a Torah perspective? And what we're what we're finding, at least from the, the, re the research, is that Torah teaches you how to handle family, how to get married, how to handle family how to move in family situations, how to raise the children, how to protect your daughters, how to lead your son to make good choices. So uh, good stuff. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, you know, it, uh, a lot of people who are in the church, I know we'll probably have many who um, 
who listen to this who come from more of a church background. That's that that's where I came from. I came from what would be considered a very Protestant background. I was a Protestant pastor. I was a pastor of a Presbyterian church for 10 years and had a master's degree um, and uh, was seminary trained and all that kind of good stuff. And yet what what we find, you know, you hear us talking about about Torah and, and putting a lot of significance on what's written in the first five books. And certainly both present truth and I both believe in the Messiah. We have faith in the Messiah and his mm -hmm. shed blood. So I, I want to make that clear. What we understand is that what God laid out in the beginning has never changed and his standards have never changed. And you will learn and understand more about how how man is supposed to function, how woman is supposed, supposed to function, uh, headship, how that's supposed to work, how the relationship between man and woman, commonly called marriage, is supposed to work. You'll learn more about that in the first five books, and nowhere else in Scripture is it ever overturned. There's some places that, that, you know, translators will make some statements that, you know, you look at and go, well, wait a minute, something changed here. No, no, nothing changed. Hasn't changed. God's word remains the same from day one, exactly what he gave to Moshe on Mount Sinai. Um, it hasn't changed. So, yeah. Um, wow. Good stuff. Long <laughs> run here. Good stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing me on to discuss these matters. And, you know, I certainly look forward to, uh, bringing more information to, you know, to the uh, family, to the uh, yeah, to absolutely. help us I, move forward as we, we look to restore coal Israel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I totally would love to have you on again. Um, I'm looking, this this is the first time I've used this software, so this might be, <laughs> a, like, might be a little bit tricky, but we're going <laughs> to gonna figure out, I, I'm, I'm speculating that we've got it all on here good. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to being able to share this and um, Good deal. and being able to go forward. So wrap it up the I'll wrap it up the way I always do. For King and Kingdom, we bid you shalom. Shalom.